I have a twofold task today. I want to speak to you on the African presence in early Europe, which is the subject of the latest journal that was published in December of last year, as well as to acquaint you with something of the life and work of a man who has just died and who is perhaps the greatest among us in the 20th century in terms of scholarship in African civilizations. Let me say something first of this man. I never met him for about 10 years. I communicated with him for a long time, for nearly a decade before I actually met him. I only met him eventually in England um, last January, not this last January, but the January of 1985. I had to speak in England on the same platform with Dr. Sheikh Anthony Yop. Dr. Sheikh Anthony Yop is the only man outside of W.E. B. Du Bois who was awarded the, a special um, award, give him a special award for being the man who's had the greatest impact on black thought in the 20th century. He is a man of extraordinary, he was a man, he died in February of this year, he died on February the 7th. He was a man of incredible versatility, he was a great physicist, he worked in the most advanced laboratory in France under Frederick Julio Curie, and Frederick Julio Curie was a close friend of Einstein, and at the time when only about a dozen people in the world could understand Einstein. Dr. Sheikh Ante Diop of Senegal translated Einstein's relativity theory into Wolof, his native language. Because of his scientific skills also, he was able to do extraordinary things. He, for example, invented a chemical process to test melanin in the skin of black people who had died thousands of years ago. By that, process he could prove beyond the shadow of a doubt in a very scientific way that the mummies, many of the mummies that had been excavated in early times belonged to black people because there's been a long question and dispute about whether they were blacks or whites or Hamites or Semites etc. But he's been able to establish this by probing in the skin that is left on the bones of some of these mummies and establishing that the density of melanin in the skins makes it quite clear they could not be of any race but African. He also, um, because of his great knowledge in this field, in the scientific field, for example, he was able to show something which I only learned about a few months ago and which has startled me, and that is that while I have been able to show in blacks and science that blacks invented an extremely advanced process for smelting steel and were in advance of the rest of the world in this process, I had never suspected that blacks had actually started iron smelting. And I'm not talking about iron mining. One knew of that a long time ago. Blacks mined iron 45,000 years ago or 43,000 years ago. It means they have found iron pits dug in South Africa. That's not important because that does not involve the technological process of changing the ore into something else. That's a highly advanced process that only occurs later in man. Now he has shown that as early as the ancient Egyptian dynasties, at the time of the building of the Great Pyramid, they found iron in between the cracks, and they said that this iron had fallen from a higher strata. That means a later strata. I had read that and I had taken it for granted as most people in the world had taken it for granted. But Diop, by studying the iron, showed that it was a soft iron and that it was not as true what Leclant and Morny, the French interpreters, said that because it was soft iron, it was inferior iron. He showed that in order to arrive at soft iron, you have to decarbonize the iron. And to decarbonize the iron, you have to reduce the carbon and you can only reduce the carbon to that state if you're in an advanced stage of iron smelting. In other words, instead of it being a low level stage, it was an advanced stage. Now only someone who's trained in that field was able, could, could establish that. 
so that his science wasn't just something where you just go and sit in a laboratory. In fact, Sheikh Anthony Up is one of the few Africans who had access to the most advanced knowledge, scientific knowledge in the world. He was the man who directed and created and founded and built up the radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, Senegal. And he was the president of the World Black Researchers Association. That is the reason why I am filled with sadness at the moment, but at the same time filled with a great hope because Sheikh Anti Diop kept saying again and again, you're going to have to work eventually without me. Why I am sad is because we were working on things that were absolutely vital that involve both Africans and Americans because our main concern is how you can have the kind of technological transfer from America, particularly through black Americans into Africa. So that this kind of gap that exists, which exists as a result of the destruction of African civilizations, need not continue forever. That is the reason why Diop formed a technological consortium. Diop also was a politician. Diop would have been the next president of Senegal. This is very important because Diop would have led, in the way Nkrumah may have been unable to, Diop was in a position to lead half of West Africa into a federation. If he had succeeded in doing that, that was the beginning of a different kind of black unity and strength on the continent. Diop also was a great Egyptologist. Nobody has written a book to date that goes as far in establishing the African basis of Egyptian civilization as Diop has in his book, The African Origin of Civilization, Myth or Reality. He's also a great linguist. He was able to establish that, Af that Egyptian language is not Afro-Semitic or Afro-Hemitic or Afro-anything, it is fundamentally African. And this he established at one of the great conferences, UNESCO conference in 1974 in Cairo, Egypt. It is amazing. Let me just read a paragraph from my editorial because I'm bringing out a book next month called Great African Thinkers, Volume 1, Sheikh Antediop, in which I summarize what happened at this great debate. And it is amazing when you read this, you get some idea of how the Africans for the first time startled European scholarship. You know, it's all very well to get up and talk about um, Africans uh, created this or invented this, etc. But when one has to stand in the international body of UNESCO and present arguments so well researched and so well argued that you have difficulty. The Europeans were completely at a loss. It, they actually reported in this report that only two people presented highly researched papers. You know who those two people were? Both of them were Africans. The only two Africans at the conference presented highly scholarly papers. That has never happened in the world since the defeat of Africa by Europe because we have always been pushed aside, we've always had inferior education, or we've always operated as though we have to be inferior. Regardless of protests, many blacks do that. And when they come into the university, I have to spend at least three weeks getting the class into a different state of consciousness before you can even begin to teach. Because people come there already bombed and blasted. Their brains are being bombed. They're excited by the lectures, but they're not learning anything. They refuse to read a book. They refuse to read a single article. And you could talk to them. I would have a lecture in which I would show them that they've discovered a kingdom in the Middle East known as Star City. The Nile Valley should be called, and that is the first kingdom found in the world, and it is black. It has 12 black kings. And I put in the board T.A hyphen, S-E-T-I, Tarseti, and I said, look, you must remember this because this is the beginning of civilization in the Nile Valley and it is to have a profound influence on Egypt. You come to the next class. This is Monday morning's class. You come to the class on Thursday. There are about 30-something students in the class. And you say, what is the significance of Tarseti? They never heard of Tarseti. That is Monday morning, you know. 
You can't teach, hence you have to bludgeon them with a totally different kind of thing and you, you can't even ask them any questions. You have to train them anew. You have to feed them with whole new facts about Africa and blacks before they can even begin to think afresh because they have already closed down their mind anything black. They would like to say yes, blacks are this and blacks are that, but if you ask them to prove it, they don't know where the proof is. Van Sertema said so, which is not good enough. <laughs> they don't know, they haven't read it, you give them handouts, they wouldn't read it. They would pick up a yellow pen and they would go through sentence for sentence and when they give you back the thing, everything is yellow. They don't know what is significant and what is not significant. That doesn't happen in our prisons, you know. I have talked to blacks in prison. Every week now, I get letters from prisoners. Anytime I have a damaged copy of a journal, I send it to the prison. You know how many people read those journals in the prisons? You would be amazed. You would be amazed. Those brothers are not fools. I've spoken in great effort to life first. And they ask far more intelligent questions and know, know more about the details of my work and that of Diop and other Africanists than my students at Rutgers University. And this is something, therefore, we have to be very careful about. We have got to educate ourselves about these things because, make no mistake about it, you may not in your lifetime be able to shift this system significantly enough off of its center to make a difference. But one thing you can do very soon, you can change your consciousness in such a way that you are able to operate and function with far greater effectiveness and power than you imagine. Make no mistake about it. I was told in 1976 when I brought out they came before Columbus, rather it came out in early 1977, that I was finished. I had signed my death warrant. You know, an, a black professor at Rutgers, I, it's no, I wouldn't call the name, a black professor at Rutgers came and told me uh, that you have signed your death warrant. By publishing, they came before Columbus, you have absolutely no chance of getting anywhere in this country. That professor is dead now. <laughs> I'm not only alive, but my ideas have begun to circulate and affect a lot of people who thought they knew better. And one is very much aware in one's own life that when I was a boy, I was absolutely persuaded and convinced by older people that the sun would never set on the British Empire. I really believed that in the way you would believe in the Bible. By the time I was a man, the sun had set. It hasn't completely set. It's not, it's a twilight though. That place is in a twilight. I remember when I went to London, after I finished they came before Columbus. Resistance, great resistance. You couldn't draw a crowd. You couldn't talk about this in London and draw a crowd. When I went back with Diop last year, you talk about crowd, you couldn't find the building to hold the people. There was my younger brother who had taken the came before Columbus and threw it across the room. He thought I was a lunatic to write a book like that. He said, you spent 10 years studying Africans? I know they hunt lions, very brave men, but what else? This is how we were trained. This is the colonized imagination. When I went back last year, he was sitting in the audience crying crying because he had spent those years suffering as a black man, realizing what it was in the living world today, where we are, what has been done to us. And therefore he was ready to hear. When he heard the words for the first time going right through his system, he cried because he knew what a long time he had spent in darkness. Let me say, let me read just a page about what happened at this Cairo conference with Diop. His greatest strength, this is from my editorial, which of the book that comes out next month, his greatest strength lay in linguistics. Assisted by the Congolese Egyptologist and linguist Theophilo Benga, now president of the Center for Bandru Studies in Brazzaville, Diop established the UNESCO Conference on the Peopling of Ancient Egypt 
that the Egyptian language was African and that it is genetically related to family of African languages, including his own native Wolof. In spite of the passion and prejudice that mark some of the debates of this conference, the UNESCO report states, quote, the linguistic reports of Professor Diop and Abengu were regarded as being very constructive and revealed a large measure of agreement among the participants. With all the fighting, they were forced by the sheer force of evidence to agree that this was something they couldn't debate any longer. A summary of this conference is of interest and value since it reveals the state of Egyptology at the moment in the defensive reaction to the question of blackness 